Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. It's been a while since I showed one of my better games, and I'm going to show you a game I'm very proud of. I was played in a tournament, I think, where I got my, I reestablished my master title, and I was playing against one of my good chess friends, uh, Richard Lunenfeld, who's also a master, and I think you really enjoy this game. It was just one of my favorites. All right, so I was white. And I played e4, and Richard played the French. I played d4, d5. I played my favorite move, knight to d2, the Tarish variation. And now the main lines for black are to play c5 and to play knight f6, but there's a whole bunch of other moves you can play. Richard played the relatively rare Guimard variation with knight to c6. Why is that rare? Well, because... White always has the possibility of closing the center at some point, and when he does, black has to break the center up. He has to strike at the base with a break move with c5. So when white has the option of playing e5, it's unusual to block your break move with knight c6. If Richard was a beginner and not a master, I would have said to him, you know, that's not a good move. You don't want to block your break move. But Richard's a master, and he knows exactly what he's doing, and he's blocking the break move on purpose because he wants to play this rare line, the Guimard variation. All right, so I remembered at least the first couple moves, which was then to play knight gf3, and he played knight f6, and then you're supposed to play e5, and he plays knight d7. Okay, here's where I go wrong. Uh, the right move here is to fight against that future break move square, c5 and to develop your pieces. So the right move is to play knight to b3, which keeps a future eye on that c5 square and also lets the, the queen bishop be developed. The other two moves that you can play here are bishop to b5 to kind of get a phantom pin against one of the knights when he tries to move them and break on the queen side, and c3. And those moves aren't quite as good. If you look over here at the engines, um, analysis, and it's depth 42, it's actually from the cloud. You can see knight b3 is the right move. The second best move is bishop e2, and I played c3, which is only the third best move. And after the game, Richard said to me, Dan, you played the same, this is not the main line, but you played the same line against me eight years ago when we played in New York. <laughs> and I told Richard, I remember playing you, but I don't remember the game. I don't remember the line, so I don't remember that game. So I I just didn't remember. So I made the same inaccuracy eight years later, not because I hadn't looked up the game, but just because it was so many years in between that I'd forgotten. So once I did it twice, then, then it kind of get into my long-term memory. And now, now I know I'm supposed to play knight b3. But you could see c3 is not a bad move. And Richard plays the only move here. You could see... F6 is the only move that keeps white's advantage under a pawn. And Richard plays F6. And now I play the best move, bishop to b5. We're still in the cloud analysis. Bishop b5, the idea is indirectly to hold off on the uh, pressure on e5 by pinning one of the knights. So here Richard should either play F takes e5 or a6. You could see they're both... Good for not equality, but almost equality. He plays a6, and now I, I have to take the knight, which I do, and he takes back. And now the engine says, now the engine's actually calculating. You can see he's not using the cloud anymore. And it says I should either play queen a4 or castles. Well, I have a good principle I teach all my students, which is if you have a bunch of candidate moves and they're all safe, and one of them is castles, you can almost never go wrong by castling. If you play one of the other moves, it may or may not be in the top three. But if you castle, it probably almost always makes the top three. So this position is no exception. I have several candidate moves. One of them is castling, and it does make the top three. And I followed my own advice, and I castled. All right, so I'm still sitting there on a little bit more than a normal advantage. We've got about 0.8 here which is very good. If you can get it up above one, you're pretty much winning. Engine says Richard should play a5. This is the kind of move you don't see amateurs play that much, but the idea of a5 isn't to stop white from playing b4. It's to simply put the bishop on its best diagonal, which is the a6 to f1 diagonal. Notice that white has no light squared bishop to oppose that bishop, 
So the bishop's going to be pretty much permanently good on that a6 square. So that's why the engine likes that move. And it's worth, if you're not familiar with that idea, it's worth it. Because notice the e6 pawn is blocking in. The, these pawns are blocking in. But this diagonal is really open. And black wants to get his pieces as strong as possible. So Richard plays the second best move. He plays f takes e5. And uh, here I want to take with the knight and open up the diagonal for my queen because I've got some lines where I can bring my queen out. And I want to also get my knight out of the way so that right now my, my knights are redundant. Grandmaster Richard, sorry, Grandmaster Larry Kaufman calls the two knights that can guard each other redundant, meaning they're very weak because they're blocking each other. And by playing knight takes e5, which is my best move, I'm trying to fix my knights so they're no longer redundant and they're doing more. Richard plays by far his best move, knight takes e5. I play d takes e5. And now, again, he should play that move a5. He could also play his thematic c5 move, even though I don't have a d pawn and still get control of the center. Third best move is bishop e7, getting ready to castle. Richard plays the provocative move queen to h4. He did this on purpose. He, what he's trying to do is control the entire king side with his queen. Because even though I can move my knight up to f3 and attack his queen, he can control the king side so that I can't get any other pieces over there. So he did that on purpose. And I played knight f3. That's my awl move. That's not really winning a tempo, although it sort of looks like winning a tempo. You know, it does get out of the way of the bishop. So I guess, you know, that's just semantics, whether it's winning a tempo or not. And Richard played queen g4, again, purposely trying to get me to push the pawn so that later on when he breaks with g4, he can open up my king. So he didn't have to do that. He could have played queen to h5, and queen h5 is better. But again, he's continuing with his idea of weakening my king side and controlling it with the queen. So I do play h3, and he plays queen to h5. Engine says it's just about as good as any move, and now my advantage is growing. Now what's interesting is up to here, uh, most of what we've been talking about is pretty mundane, and uh, we've played half the moves of the game already, and yet uh, almost all the uh, analysis and talking is going to start coming soon, because... Things are going to get very complicated fairly quickly here. All right, so in the game, I played queen to a4. Engine says that was my best move. The idea of that is to try to force him to tie up some of his forces guarding the queen side, sort of like what he's doing with his queen on the king side. So what my queen is on the queen side, his queen is on the king side. We're both con completely controlling that side of the board. So he guards his c6 pawn with his bishop. And now again, I play the best move. It's nice to have these engines tell me that I actually am playing well. I play queen to a5, and the idea there is to again tie up his pieces, guarding that c7 square, so that when I start developing, he's not going to be able to keep up with me in development. So he has a choice now of playing rook to c8 or king to d8. I don't think he can play rook to a7 to guard the pawn with on c7 because I have bishop to e3. And then he'd have to either leave the C pawn or the A pawn hanging. The engine says he should just give me that pawn. The engine says he should play bishop e7 and let me play queen takes c7. But humans don't like to do that. So Richard plays a move. He he knows in the French when, the, when he has that pawn center that you can very often keep your king in the center. And he plays king to d8. And now my, my lead is growing here. And now I play one of my favorite moves of the game. And what's kind of funny about it is my position's good enough that I, I don't have to play this move. And I was very proud of this move. And after the game, I was very proud of this move. And in the book I wrote on my, called The Improving Annotator, where I put this game in the book, I gave this move like an exclamation point. And Stockfish likes to embarrass me and is saying, yeah, Dan, I'm sure your move wins the game, but you have at least three moves that are better. So let's look at the top five moves here, see if my move even makes the top five. Uh, no, just to make it more embarrassing. Oh, there it is. C4 just popped in there as number five. That's my move. I really like that move, breaking up his center 
and trying to expose the king, and I'm getting ready to make further sacrifices. So I play c4. I'm not worried he's going to win the pawn. I can always, with those all those isolated triple pawns, I can win them back easily. Also, if he plays d takes c5, that would open up the d file to attack his king. There's no way in the world a good player is going to take that pawn, even though it's not guarded. You know, he can't really hold it. So the question is, what should he do? Well, he plays his best move by far. He needs to, to get his pieces out, so he plays bishop e7. And the idea of bishop e7 is to play g5 and then g4 and force me to take with the pawn and open up the g file for his rook. So I have to do something. And my idea here is that I'm going to sacrifice a pawn. So I play the best move. C takes d5. And now he has two ways to take. If he takes with the c pawn, I'll, I'll actually make the moves on the board to show you. I was going to play bishop to e3 and then play rook to c8, piling up on the c pawn, which he can't easily guard with his bishop. And I don't think he can hold the queen side now. He's opening up too many lines to his king. And Stockfish says bishop e3 is okay, but even more accurate is bishop to d2, which I probably would not have played. All right, so in the actual game, Richard Lindenfeld played e takes d5. And uh, this is the position that I had envisioned when I played c4. And I said, oh, this is kind of neat. I have a really nice clearance sacrifice here to give me a strong attack. And now... When you sacrifice like this, sometimes you can figure it all out, and then it's a, not a, we call that a pseudo-sacrifice. If you can figure it all out and, you know, you're going to get your material back by force. If you just see that you're just going to get long-term pressure, that's a real sacrifice. So this is sort of a real sacrifice here. I play e6, and black has pretty much no choice but to take the pawn, because I'm going to do what I'm going to do to him pretty much anyway, whether he takes it or not. And... He's got, all of a sudden, he's got big problems here because I'm opening the lines in the middle of the board and I'm willing to sacrifice that pawn. So this is called a clear, this is a clearance sacrifice. I'm clearing out the E file. I'm clearing out the H2 to, to G8, sorry, B8 diagonal here by making that move. So I play E6, Richard takes it, and now I develop with tempo. I play Bishop to F4. Now, can you see why he can't play bishop d6 and neutralize my bishop? I'm sure most of you can. The answer is, oh, Charles Hurtan's sneaky pins. If he plays bishop d6, I just take it off, and the pawn can't really take because it's pinned. So he can't do that. So, he, so in order to save his pawn here, because he can't really let me play queen takes pawn check, he's going to have to guard it with the rook. So he could play rook a7, but again, if he plays rook a7... I can simply put a rook on e1, skewer the bishops, and then if he saves one of the bishops, I can threaten to take the other one and then bring the other rook over. And that exchange sacrifice is going to be pretty much winning because I'm going to have all my pieces in the attack and he's not going to have enough pieces defending. And we'll show you that in a minute because that's sort of what's going to happen in the game. So he could play rook a7, but he plays rook c8, and we're going to see the same thing here. I play rook f e1. I could also play the other rook over. Let's see what the engine says. Engine says both rooks are about equally good. All right, let's show what happens if he plays a normal move here. A normal move here would be a move that, let's say, guards the bishop or moves the bishop. So let's try some normal moves. Let's say he tries bishop to d7. All right, well, my idea on these kind of moves is to play something like um, I could either play knight e5 or I can play rook takes e7. Engine agrees that rook takes e7 is better. I can also play the smooth queen to c3. Engine likes that. But here's my ideas, and you'll see it in the game also. Rook takes e7, king takes, rook checks again. He can't play king e8 because bishop checks will win the queen. The only move he can get out would be to sacrifice his queen. If he moves his king over here, then I've got moves like either g4 or knight e5 check. If I play knight e5 check and he tries to guard the bishop again, I have all these discovered checks, winning material. If he plays king to, instead of king to f7, if he plays king to f8, then I get my queen into the attack. 
with like queen c5 check and when he goes king over here engine says i can play rook to the seventh rank this rook is out of the game and i've got all kinds of threats with bishop e5 and putting the queen on the diagonal and rook takes d7 so moving the bishop doesn't work let's say he tries to guard the bishop let's say he plays um king to d7 all right again i have uh, multiple winning ideas here um knight e5 check is always good if he plays king back to where he came from i can play knight takes pawn check hitting the bishop hitting the other bishop and his position is completely falling apart plus 13 says the engine anyway we could look at this for a while and see why all these moves that let's do one more queen to g6 let's say queen to f7 looks like a reasonable move guards the bishop hits the guards hit guards his bishop hits my bishop but now i can play a move like knight g5 or even better bishop g5 the engine says threatening to take the bishop and then whichever way he takes the, the bishop would be pinned and he can't take my bishop because when I take back with the knight, I'm forking the queen and the bishop. And if he tries to play a move like rook to e8, engine says hit the queen. If he tries to save the queen, queen to f5. Here we go again, knight c6 check. King here. Now I could just take here, hitting the queen and hitting the rook. He would have to take my bishop with his queen. I can take the rook. If he tries to threaten checkmate like this, check. He can't take the, the knight because I take the rook with check, but he really can't do anything. Engine says c6, knight b6 check, saving the knight. King c7, hitting it. Knight takes d5 check, blasting him open. He's still threatening mate, but I've got all these tactics and... Basically, this is just all winning. Anyway, back to the game. So in the game, Richard uh, decided to counter-sacrifice, and he took advantage of my overworked g-pawn by playing bishop takes h3 with the idea that if I play g takes h3, he can play queen takes f3, and then he's okay. But of course, my idea here is to... Um, is to sacrifice the rook and get the other rook into the attack and then this bishop and this knight are going to come in and help just like in some of the lines we just looked at so here i played rook takes e7 i believe the engine says i could actually play bishop takes check first and if he moves takes with the king then i can play rook takes e7 he can't take with the rook it's pinned and i'm threatening queen takes c8 c7 mate he can't guard it with the queen. If he takes with the king, I have queen takes check. And again, without this rook in the game, king f6, queen takes c6 check, and looking like he's I'm chasing him all over the board and up seven pawns here. All right, back to the game. So after bishop takes h3, take all the lines off the board, I play rook takes e7. Okay, and now Richard doesn't like taking the rook because I play queen c5 check. And again, he's got problems. If he goes this way, I can play knight e5 check. And I'm forcing him out. If he plays now king back, I can play bishop check. It's the old fork trick. I'm, I'm threatening mate, but if he plays queen takes, I have knight check winning the queen. You're always look, on the lookout for these kind of nice little patterns that the pieces can do. Um, if he moves this king to the this side of the board, then that gives me the check here. Let's say he does it without the check, but if he goes here, now my knight can come in. Knight check, and if worse comes to worse, I can just take the bishop and be up two pieces for a rook. I might even have better than that. If he plays, well, there's nothing else to play. I think I've run out of moves. He can't play king f8. We looked at king f7. If he stays on the e file, of course, I get a free rook check. And then I get to do all those same things. King f7. Now rook e7 check, the engine says. King g8. 
Everything's winning here. Bishop e5, threading this pawn. He, you can't play chess with your rook and the blocked out of here. It's just almost as if he's down this rook. All right, back to the game. So after rook takes e7, Master Richard Lunenfeld played queen to g4, threatening mate, hoping to make me spend some time playing some defense. And now my best move, well, actually Stockfish says it's not my best move. It's interesting because I always thought my best move here was bishop takes c7 check, and it is winning easily, plus 7.1. But actually now Stockfish 14 says I could just stop the mate with Bishop G3 and I'm winning. So all those moves are winning. Bishop C7 check is fun. If he takes the rook, I come over here check again. If he tries to come up, I get this pawn with check and he's falling apart. If he goes here, then I win his queen. If he goes King d7, I have check, and then I can bring my rook into the game with... You see how I get all my pieces in the, these attacks constantly here, and now I can win as queen, but it's also mate and nine. All right, so back to queen g4. So I have lots of ways to win the game, but I couldn't resist the, the next move, which Stockfish says is my third best move, and it's almost as good as my best moves. I played... I didn't get a chance to play moves like this very often. I played rook d7 check. <laughs> I thought that was kind of an amusing move because he only has two legal moves, three legal moves. King takes d7, queen takes d7, and king e8. But they all lose miserably. For instance, if he plays king takes d7, then knight e5 check wins the queen. If he plays queen takes d7, then I have either rook e1 followed by bishop g5 check first, or I can play bishop g5 first. Or I can play knight e5. There are, all these moves are winning. Let's let's show you. Rook e1. Let's threatening bishop checks. Let's say he plays h6 to stop the check. Then I hit his queen. He tries to save the queen somewhere. Let's say queen f5. Knight takes c6 check. King d7. Engine says I have a million moves to win here. It says I could play knight to b8 check. Or I could play queen a4, threading and discover. I guess you have all these pieces around his king. Queen a4 threatens rook to e7 mate. If he plays rook over here, I have knight b8 check. King d8, queen takes e8 checkmate. So I couldn't resist playing the aesthetically kind of cutesy move rook d7. So Richard thought for a long time, and by now, as you could understand, he's in time trouble because, you know, the last 10 moves have been just a series of, you know, really tough defensive ideas for him. So here he thought for a while, I think he thought till he only had a, a few minutes left on his clock, and he decided all those moves were hopeless. I think, I think on queen d7, I can't remember if I was planning to play bishop check. This is actually not as good. After king e8, rook e1 check, he can play bishop e6. So here the engine says I should just take the bishop. And now he could actually get the rook in the game. But the engine says he should not. Engine says he should run the king over there. Says I should just guard my pawn. He could play king over here and then try to play h6. And now I just have a winning game with with two pieces against a rook. So that wouldn't have been as good. So I would have, in order to, after queen takes, rather than playing bishop checks, I should play knight e5 or rook e1. Those are, the, rook e1 is very thematic. Once I cut off the king and get my pieces up there, bad things are going to happen. So that would have been a better idea. We'll never know what I would have played since Richard didn't play that move. And I didn't get a chance to study it in, in as much detail. I studied it and I realized I had a whole bunch of good lines. But what, what, what I actually would have played, when you, know, when, you, when you see good lines, you play the line, but then you don't know exactly which of those good lines you're going to play until it's your move and he actually plays it, because I don't know he's going to play queen takes d7, and he didn't. He played king to e8. And I said, you can't do that. I said, I'm up a piece right here, and now I can make a move which will keep me up a piece. I think he said he didn't see this move, but it's just a resigns kind of move. I played queen e1 check, getting the queen back in the game. 
And now the problem is, if he moves the king, it's like mate and two. And if he takes the rook with the king, I check him and I win his queen. So he's out of moves. He has to put his queen in the way. But now he's just down this bishop. All I have to do is save the rook. So that's what I did. I didn't take too long in these moves. I saved the rook. And not only am I up a piece, but I'm trading queens. And also he's got a terrible position. He moves the king over. I say, all right, let's trade queens. And now I threaten a discovered attack. I'm threatening rook takes c7 check. Or uh, I'm threatening all kinds of things. And he quickly moves out of the discovery. And I pin his bishop. And, of course, he resigns here. No mas. So that was one of my favorite games. Um, just quickly, again, going through all the moves, you could kind of see the flow of the game here. We have a Guimard French. We have Dan playing the wrong line again. Not a terrible line. I'm still ahead by 0.7. The thematic other break in the center with F6. Richard not playing exactly the most accurate moves. Now he's provoking, pro, provoking me on the king side. And I'm going to do the same kind of thing on the queen side. And now I break open the center. Stockfish says, good move, Dan, but not the best. Still, I like it. Bishop e7 takes, takes that way. Sack the pawn. Threaten the c7 pawn. Threaten the skewer and threaten to sacrifice the exchange. Counter sacrifice, counter sacrifice, threaten mate, counter sacrifice. You can see it actually wasn't that many moves, but there was so all those lines that could have been played. And now he puts the queen in the way. Now it's just mop up time. Just save your rook. You don't have to do anything fancy. Just trade queens. You're winning. Save my rook, win the bishop, end of game. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed today's game. Uh, best thing you can do is tell your friends about the channel, Dan Heisman Chess. Hope you enjoy my videos on how to get better at chess. Got a lot of them. And if you'd like, you can like the video. You can subscribe to the channel. We will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.